Thanks, Robin, and uh, thanks everyone for making the time to come here today. Really appreciate it. And as Robin said, it's the collective effort of all of us that will make a real difference in this industry. And um, the construction industry is really ripe for change. And I, I, I truly believe that you know uh, we're all there wanting to innovate and it is the government agenda at this point in time and uh, we've got the desire there we now just need to enact it. Uh, what I'm going to share with you today is a, a quick rundown about who John Holland is but I want to provide a broad context probably from a business point of view because one of the things I found implementing the sustainability strategy within John Holland which we've well and truly at that phase where we're about to implement it uh, is that you've really got to put it in business terms otherwise it doesn't necessarily resonate and the other part is that uh, it has to be understood at all levels and essentially you know uh, it's it's a hurdle all of us will go through whether you're a large organization or uh, you know a smaller small to medium sized enterprise mm -hmm. So John Holland really has existed for about 65 years, uh, founded by Sir John Holland, and uh, well and truly we still live the values of Sir John. He, you know, it was all about ten tenacity and innovation, and and uh, you know doing it right by the community and our people, and it very much stands with um, where we are today. We essentially operate right across Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia, and we we uh, deliver integrated services in the rail infrastructure and rail and. Um, building group and are across uh, 17 sectors. So you can just imagine the, the broad uh, uh, width and depth of, of Holland's. It's, it's quite uh, remarkable. And uh, one thing we're committed to doing is actually making our cities and regions livable. And it's, it's, it's one of the key things that you know, we've been doing for years, but perhaps not articulated as well and very much focused on it now. Um, as I uh, said to, and uh, responded in to, um, Robin's question, 70% of our spend is on suppliers and we've got thousands of suppliers, as you can imagine, a project-based business uh, does so. And we try and engage as local as we can and, um, yeah, at times have to sort of uh, move beyond uh, based on, I suppose, the technology, the materials that we're after. We were certainly one of the founding members of uh, the school, I, uh, you know, when I remember when Ned Balance back in the time and now EY came to us way back in 2012 and proposed it, we sort of latched on we couldn't see a better way of uh, increasing the knowledge of sustainability across uh, our supplies I mean we can try as individuals but essentially it is a very difficult task and what we then end up doing is you know sharing our own views about sustainability and that in the end only confuses suppliers um, I won't yeah it is a free online resource as Robin says and really what we're now trying to do is bed it into our, our procurement process and I'll sort of chat about how we're trying to do that a bit later on in my presentation. And something unique about the school as well and probably um, unique to this industry is the fact that a number of competitors have come together to establish the school and essentially, you know, um, typically we're sort of in war with each other, you know, <laughs> to win projects, but we quickly understood that, you know, we use the same supplier base and it would make very little sense for us to individually go, go ahead and do so. And it was, uh, you know, one way of showing what sustainability does. True sustainability means within any industry, not just c construction. All right, so I'll just quickly run through or provide a broad context uh, about sustainability, how it, you know, uh, we sort of term it or reference it within the industry. And uh, essentially it, it builds on uh, these uh, sustainable development goals and all of the other frameworks that Robin shared. Um, then talking about uh, how uh, you know, we are looking to create a future fit business within Hollands and hopefully some of those principles will uh, help all of you um, as well and the last is you know what our procurement process looks like so that you've got a, a bit of an understanding of what it is. So essentially from um, a, a, a context perspective essentially there are three global trends that are driving this industry and I sort of distill it as uh, population and urbanization we know that you know there's close to uh, nine billion um, it's forecast that there's close to nine, uh, going to be close to nine billion in 2050. So that's a, a, a huge amount uh, in comparison. And from all accounts, it sounds like you know we will be doubling the population size just in Australia and um, by 2030. And so what that will create is greater need for infrastructure, uh, water, energy, and and um, food. But 
As well, what's uh, playing with that is uh, the resource scarcity and um, the fact that, you know, uh, these climate-related impacts that, that is more and more so affecting us. So we've really got to bear that in mind and, and, and the construction industry, for one, can really con contribute to that agenda. Technology is also uh, certainly playing its role in, in the changes that are occurring within the industry. What we're starting to witness is a whole lot of new materials, you know, recycled materials, um, materials that are, are using far, far less inputs than it has previously. Um, new designs and construction methodologies um, and real-time data. We, we, we're currently seeing it in buildings, but it will well and truly be in all types of infrastructure. Um, you know, the rail and the roads are, are well and truly embracing all of that as well. And it's now more about how we make uh, our infrastructure to respond to user demands. The flip side is data security, and I'm not sure whether anyone will necessarily get to the bottom of that. But those two, and in particular technology, is changing people's values or shifting people's values. What we're finding, and I'll, this diagram probably explains it a little bit better, is that back in the 50s and 70s, it was all around mass consumption and, um, you know, that the product is king uh, from a corporate perspective. But today what we're seeing is, is, is a lot more... Um, social responsibility being displayed by businesses and it's being driven by the changes in individual social values. But what's being forecast is that in the 21st century it'll be all around emotional consumption. You know, people will understand, you know, uh, or want to understand what's behind the products and services that they're acquiring. And as businesses, we we will need to, to provide them all of that information. Um, it's not just going to be a, a, a case of blind loyalty. It's well and truly shifting. Um, from where it has been. So essentially, as a business, you know, when you think about trying to set a, a future fit business, it's, it's, it's important to know our place within the overall picture. Essentially, companies uh, well and truly rely on society. You know, we, 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 uh, we, we're providing products and services that, we, you know, that are needed by them. And, and I suppose the, the purchase of it is what uh, creates the demand. And both businesses and society rely on environment or, or uh, the essential services the environment uh, provide uh, for us uh, all to be viable. So those interdependencies really can't be lost by any uh, business and, and we really need to take that into account in our operations and our interactions. Um, and uh, I suppose as, as Robin clearly mentioned, it's, it started, sustainably started off as a, an environmental agenda, but it was quickly realised that really it does also impact people and, and um, there needs to be a lot longer term thinking applied to the way businesses are operated, operating or governments are operating and we need to look at what the real social issues are and respond. And social issues are business opportunities and, you know, those 17 SDG goals uh, highlight those issues for us quite transparently and it's a matter of us looking at, okay, if those are the issues, how is it that we can respond with products and services that will make a difference uh, to the current and, and the future generation without impacting it. So from a Holland's perspective, essentially what we um, have done is, 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 I suppose, try and crystallise what this all means from a business perspective and, and as well uh, realising that we are a project-based business, be very clear about what, you know, we can, where we can make a tangible difference. Uh, we've set three goals that will be launched. Uh, so you're all about the first kind of year from a public point of view. And that is um, that, you know, it's, it's yes, it is about how we work and, and, and you know, what, and it's what we've coined great place to work. It is about, you know, our contributions to, to society and really looking at where it is that we can increase um, or better the lives of, of, of um, the communities within we work through the infrastructure we provide, but also through our engagement and interaction. Uh, and you cannot have any conversation within a business without really knowing what your future, what your capabilities are and what your future capabilities need to be. I read an article somewhere and uh, I'm pretty sure it was uh, in Forbes and it said, you know, typical lifespans of businesses were 75 years, but they're now well and truly diminished to about 15 years. So, at most. So, 
you know, what you may think is relevant today may not be in 5, 10 or 15 years. So you've got to be constantly thinking about, you know, what else, you, you know, uh, will serve people um, in time. So that future capability agenda is something that we certainly didn't want to lose. Uh, from a project perspective, we've crystal, crystallised it to 10 um, sustainability elements. And as you will see, it's very holistic. It's, it's not just about environment. It certainly has uh, the um, social side of things from an internal perspective, our people as well as an external. But also the way we con uh, conduct and manage ourselves is extremely important. That's the governance aspect of sustainability. And, you know, cost is, is paramount. If we if we aren't uh, a profitable business, we aren't going to be able to contribute to the overall um, agenda of society. So we, we still do need to make a, a living, but it's about how we go about thinking uh, of it, and it is about taking that longer-term approach. Um, and I suppose one of the things I, I, I've uh, emphasised within our organisation is the fact that um, it's not just about setting goals and it's not just about identifying elements, you know, that we need to focus on. We really need to build it within our business and what better way to do it uh, than really take it into account during our business planning process. And that three horizon approach is an, uh, an approach that Hollands has, has adopted and, and what it is about is understanding what you can implement now and well and truly trying to maximise the potential um, of your core business activities. But also in terms of market change, how is it that if you think that, you know, that product or service is going to be good for society, you advocate that change. You need to start thinking about that now if you want to realise, uh, you know, it as a, a, a true business service in five, ten years' time. The second is all around the next phase of change. So, yes, we know where we are here, you know, and now, but how can we actually extend our, your current capabilities and co competencies? Because we know that the agenda is going to evolve. And the third is about looking at those future opportunities. And uh, taking that three horizon approach is, I suppose, a, a disciplined way of integrating it within the business. And, and yes, there's a whole raft of other things that go with it. And that is, you know, uh, leadership behavior and, and your systems and processes. But if it's not considered in the planning phase, you, it's really going to be missed out. And the other critical element that I constantly share and uh, within the business, but all, you know, I thought would be quite useful is this whole values conversation. I often get that, oh yeah, but you only want the lowest price. Yes, we need to ensure that we get you know um, the best cost out of a product or service. But essentially, it's not just about cost. It's it's about what are those added. Um, you know, a value that you're you're providing, you know, what is the enhancements in those products and services, you know, from a safety point of view, from a community's point of view, um, from a, 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 you know, a, a risk to the service point of view. So really it's about thinking what are those enhancements in the products and services? And as well, of course, through your experiences, your networks, your logistics, your own supply chains, you can create cost saving. So it is about, you know, a values conversation as opposed to one whereby it's just about the lowest price. I think if you, we all look within our businesses, essentially what you'll find is that, you know, for the price that we are perhaps, um, uh, for the price that we're currently delivering, we can certainly gain or realise additional value. And of course, there's a point where that bottoms out as well. But it's about, are we truly providing value um, to the societies? Because ultimately, a lot of this infrastructure is paid by our taxpayers or communities out there. So, you know, as an industry, we've got a real opportunity to look at that as well. And I did have an example, and Nev, you're here. So, you <laughs> uh, one of the, the things that CRN did, and I, I thought this was, you know, a bit of weight training, but uh, essentially it isn't. And Nev's told me about 19 times I'm talking about the nut, not the bolt. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what um, I suppose CRN do look at from an asset point of view is how they can enhance that asset over a longer term. And this is a, a, a simple but I thought a good example of what sustainability means. And, and these bolts are used to lock in the bridges or actually fasten um, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, I guess, the uh, what would you call it? Nev? That's exactly right. And well. oh, mainly. <laughs> <laughs> but what I thought was great was that, you know, they, look, it's, it's, what they have done is enhanced uh, the nut. Uh, essentially, what 
the previous nut did have this softer material within it and it's in, and what with the rattling of of the trains going back and forth it did create extra noise and um and um uh, I, I suppose a safety risk if if uh, it did unbolt uh, and 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 it would cause issues to the rail line with this uh sort of newer softer material within it 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 enhances the uh the almost breaking capabilities so to speak and the nuts don't rattle off as quickly even the bolt the bolt is two to three dollars more expensive it's those additional features that help reduce the risk that and you know helps uh, are, are the deciding factors for us to go down a certain path from a procurement point of view. So it's not necessarily always the lowest cost. It's, you know, there's a whole raft of other things. And and this is where, you know, I always talk about this um, value equation point of view, although my example may not be as well explained as never could at any point in time. So from a procurement process, uh, Holland's uh, is really moving to uh, uh, what we call a seventh, 30 uh, supply valuation process, uh, 70 on commercials and, and 30 on the non-commercials. And without a shade of a doubt, if suppliers looked at the non-commercial aspects of it and optimised it, it, it really would optimise your, your commercial or your, you know, your dollar for your product and services. Uh, so a breakdown of uh, the evaluation essentially of the non-commercials includes the methodology by which your, your um, developing their product or, or, or the service you're providing. Um, and no doubt we've got quite strict specifications that we need to meet and, and whatever product or service will have to uh, meet that. Um, the other is uh, the management side of things. Have you actually got robust and effective systems and uh, plans or risk management plans to uh, ensure that, you know, the, the various factors have been taken into account. Uh, the third is your, the conduct and uh, are you able to c conform or, or demonstrate that you've actually got a code of business conduct um, and your external stakeholder relationship skills. Health, safety and quality have been there for a very long time and uh, the, the final is social responsibility and really this is about uh, innovations leading to improved outcomes, you know, that have uh, uh, societal benefits such as, you know, uh, diversity within the workforce, um, the, the training and development, the local employment, all those sort of things uh, certainly does enable a, an additional 2% to the overall score of those assessments. So it's taking a holistic view, I suppose, and some may argue that, you know, you're 70, 30, right, but I think you've got to start somewhere really, don't you? And, and this is the sort of process that we're initiating. The other part we're, we're trying to do is um, utilise the school and uh, included or incorporated within our overall uh, procurement process. Uh, as you'll see that, you know, we're really looking at um, driving the engagement with the school early within the, um, the procurement process and, and right up front in the pre-qualification stages and then progress the commitment and the utilisation of the school resources as, as, the, uh, as we get closer to the, the uh, tender award or the contract award um, and the two deferring lines are, are those within the panel uh, 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 our panel con uh, supplier as and and um, those we that aren't so essentially what we see is that um, yes we have an evaluation process but how can we actually bring our suppliers along that journey and that, that, that there is that common understanding instead of us um, uh, uh, I suppose trying to do all of it on our own and, and, and not be able to um, necessarily uh, share it as effectively as we could. And uh, after all, you know, the school is a free resource. So, uh, so I suppose from an innovation point of view, um, it's all about smart cities. You probably have heard everyone talk about it and it certainly is what is resonating within businesses such as John Holland. Uh, and so it is, in simple terms, integrated infrastructure and, uh, you know, smart integrated infrastructure. So it's, it's all about low resources, prefabrication, not that, you know, prefabrication is new, but it's taking it to the next level, um, increased durability, 
intelligent asset management and um, how can we actually reduce our, our O&M and our, our, our refurbishment costs. And this is just some of the few things, you know, suppliers can think about and I'm sure all of you have others that we may not have mentioned here that, you know, you could easily share um, during the workshop sessions. So, yeah. So I suppose that's the journey Hollands has been on and uh, hopefully it gives all of you a bit of a an idea or a snapshot of how you know it is possible to integrate these things that sometimes seem so complex to most businesses um, by breaking them down into some you know simple sort of concrete elements that can uh, definitely be taken into account throughout your business operations. Thank you. Um, thank you, Renuka. That was, again, I, I love hearing the story from the, the emotional consumption side to the real nuts and bolts example, if you'll excuse the terrible pun. Um, but I also find it fascinating that if you're looking at procurement decisions, 30% of the focus is not on commercial reasons. It, it's on the other side of that. That's a fascinating part of the journey because it means that we're, you know, we're looking, we've got a really broadening focus there. I'll return that to you before I leave it somewhere. <laughs> Thank you.